The king sat atop his stallion, riding down a worn path through an open field. The trees in the distance painted an autumn scene with their leaves of red, yellow, orange, and brown. The leaves were as colorful as they were going to get this year, and from here on things were only going to die. Strange thought. Such beauty in death. Such gladness and sorrow. Lady Alice had shown no signs of such sorrow. During the riot, she was shaking, with a grin that nearly touched her ears, panting and moaning. Thousands were dying, yet she was joyful. That was the best riot we've ever had, she had said. And it had better be the last. He worried for his youngest son, being betrothed to such a woman. Though Gerald himself was a tad queer, and likely too intelligent for his own good. Even so, she was the lady of the most prosperous city in the world, and it would do no good to speak any ill of her. The city guard had shot well over half of those who died, but Sir Jacob, Sir Simon Baker, Sir Frederick Thorncrest, and this traveler named Z had taken the rest. That added up to around 4,000 each, which would have been 20 times what the songs said of Sir Jacob's greatest feat. Though he was certain that the number was much lower, since rioters were killing each other even more so than his knights. Even so, someone was sure to write a song celebrating the knights. This world is a strange one, and twisted. Men are celebrated for how many men they can kill. Yet even so, it was he himself who gave the order. If he hadn't, how many more would have been killed? How many innocent lives who were trying to escape would have been slaughtered in the riot? It was an evil to kill so many, to be sure, but a necessary evil, and the lesser one at that. It was a strange thought, to bring good by doing bad. That was a lesson he had learned when he was all too young. He remembered the tears in his father's eyes after returning from the dungeon. They live in horrid conditions, George. No man, no matter what he has done, should be forced to live like that, King Joel had said. Prince George went to the dungeon to see for himself, and while it smelled horrid and was dark, the prisoners had food and beds, more than some had even before their sentencing. They shall be fined, his father said, and the gallows were dismantled. In that time, a robber could steal twenty gold and be fined five, and those wealthy enough could pay to do as they pleased. Rapes and burglaries had easily doubled, and murders and assaults had as well. George attributed that to an unrequited sense of justice. The people were being violated, and they weren't getting justice. They felt the only restitution they could get was by taking it themselves. Young George learned quickly that evil must be punished, and harshly, if it is to be extinguished. Though he took no joy in condemning criminals to death, he knew that justice must be done. Those who would commit crime must be fearful to do so. In his first year as king, rapes stopped nearly completely. Those found guilty were gelded, and those found guilty of violence as well were gelded, then hung. The city guard was instructed to shoot any who ran, those who tried to escape justice. Yet, month by month, each arrow loosed had become fewer and fewer, and the gallows were empty more often than not. The fall breeze was cold on the king's bare scalp. He had hair before he assumed the throne, yet nearly every strand atop his head had abandoned him, and the ones that stayed had gone the way of the autumn leaves, turning from chestnut to gray. That all happened the very year he became king. Stress does horrible things to a man. He quickly got used to the position, however, and after the first year he was able to sleep routinely, and began eating again. Sir Jacob and Sir Frederick were on either side of him. If they were upset about slaying hundreds, possibly thousands, they showed no sign of it. Sir Frederick's brow was furrowed, but it was likely caused by the sun in his eyes. Sir Jacob was aloof as ever. The two of them had quite the day previously, especially Sir Frederick. He fought in the tournament and then stopped a riot. But who had impressed him the most was this traveler, Z. After the riot was quelled, Z courteously returned the king's sword. It was an honor to use such a fine blade, he said. Z was interesting to look at. 
His eyes were almond-shaped and nearly yellow, showing some type of ferocity that hid beneath his kind demeanor. The king offered him a knighthood then and there. Knights had been made for far less. He even suggested the idea of adding a sixth man to the king's guard, but Z respectfully declined. I'm in this for the fighting, he said. Though this champion's purse will do me well, I would have fought for nothing. That was a queer thought. How anyone could so casually kill so many was a mystery. Once, when he was just the prince, he rode in to settle a dispute between Lang's Peak and Laudertown, and a battle erupted. He fought alongside Sir Grant Grey, and had killed two men himself. He retched immediately afterward, and missed sleep for two days, after which nightmares haunted him. The sound as the blade slid through the meat, the way the blade stuck into their flesh when he hit them, the resistance when it hit bone. He had no idea how anyone could take any joy in that. I am waiting for an associate of mine anyway. I will be heading south with him. I will be heading south with him. The king had decided to host a supper with Z, a precedent he didn't want to set, but one he decided this warrior deserved. Upon Z's request, they dined on hard cheese and salted meats. The king hated nearly all of it. The cheese was far too sharp, and the salted meat was hard to chew. The king decided to just ask outright. Do not think me rude for asking, but your name is just Z? It doesn't stand for something? Nope, was all he said. If you ever find yourself in Linwood, Z, I will have a high-quality blade crafted to your liking, the king had said. I do plan on it, though if I would be allowed to make a request, it would be for aid for me or one of my associates. I assure you, it would be regarding common interest for both us and your kingdom. The king was intrigued. Is that so? What common interest could that be? I am uncertain if I'm being honest. I mostly do the fighting. The king decided to leave it at that. He did meet with Z's associate the next morning, a young man named Ben Blacksheep, along with another man with wild eyes and shaggy hair who also had a name that was a single letter, S. Ben Blacksheep was courteous enough, if not a tad suspicious. He constantly shifted his eyes to Sir Jacob, almost like he recognized him. But Sir Jacob obviously didn't recognize this Ben. They both had the same curved blade as Z, so it must have been their signature. Many Eastern Holds had such traditions, learning one style of sword or axe, though it was clear that Z knew many. When asked about their common interest, Ben Blacksheep only said, let me do some preparation, and if I deem it possible, I shall seek your aid. He also mentioned meeting Gerald. That foolish boy. He wants to go unnoticed, and he tells everyone who he is. I hope he has more decorum in Gardenfell. The king worried, then. What if Gerald's true intentions were found out? They couldn't unless he told someone, which he was like to do. Gerald couldn't keep a secret if you paid him. And then there were his other two children, night and day. The two rarely got along, and always gave each other dirty looks in the council chamber. His daughter was stern and mean, and had scared away her betrothed a few years back with her prickly demeanor, causing much grief for the realm that took many meetings and gifts to remedy. And his soft-hearted son, who didn't understand the concept of justice, who sat with tears in his eyes during any sentencing, who had constantly shown disapproval for his father's kingship, had thrown criminals in the under dungeon. And what other messes will they have made for me to clean? Lady Alice saw them off later that morning, and they had been on the road since. Soon, the trees began to get bigger and bigger, until they were under a red and yellow and orange canopy, and the falling leaves danced around them in the breeze. The walls of Linwood grew closer, the tall yellow bricks and the red merlins, and Linwood Keep with its five towers. No heads on pikes. We're off to a good start, then. The gate opened for the king's party, and the crowd gathered, chanting, Knight of Knight! Knight of Knight! Perhaps they thought that Sir Jacob had won the tournament again. He stepped into his throne room, 
with its peaked archways and columns, its blue carpet and marble floors, its stained glass of St. Lynn and George I and King Joramy above the Ashwood throne. And on the throne sat his son Geoffrey, whispering to his sister. And they were both laughing. What is the meaning of this? Geoffrey realized that his father had returned. Oh, hello, father. I'm glad to see that you have returned safely. Yes, father. You gave us quite the scare when we heard of the riot. How does word travel faster than horses? Yes, well, I can see that neither of you have burned the castle to the ground, and the ash trees remain. I take it all is well. Geoffrey sprang to his feet and trotted down the dyes. Yes, indeed. My sister and I have figured how to improve our coin problem. Oh, no. And what is that? I am interested to hear. The king began to walk, and his children and knights followed. Georgine easily sauntered beside him. Trade is down because of war in the Seven Holds. Linwood and Luxvale are at war, and their borders follow the trade road. Well, that makes little sense, said the king. Trade should be up. Troops need supplies. Exactly, said Geoffrey. And if troops don't get supplies, they can't fight. That is precisely why trade is down. If the other side cannot get resources, they will not fight. I suppose that is true enough. So what is your proposal? Now, father, hold your excitement, said Georgine. We sent the standing army in to conquer the trade road. You what? Both of his children had big smiles on their faces. In that second, King George thought of every possible scenario or plan that would have been superior to conquering the trade road. A peace treaty? A conclave? A compromise? And he came up with none. I am... Impressed. Good work. Georgine and Geoffrey smiled at each other, bigger and brighter than he had ever seen either of them smile. He supposed that was good. He was upset that his children had decided to go to war without him, but he had told Geoffrey that he was acting king. Knowing when to intervene was part of being king, after all. So, what were you doing on the throne? Was there something you were expecting? Yes, actually, said Geoffrey. We received an owl earlier with a message from Lord Michael Robbins of Mifflind. Don't worry. We have sent word to the standing army that they are merely to hold the ground until we have heard from this lord. To be honest, I'm glad you are back to see him. I wouldn't know what to say. Well, we are invading his hold, though his war affects us implicitly. Did he give a time? I assume it must be soon. Georgine snuck her head in front of them. Yes, he should be arriving today. Hopefully within the hour, though I am unsure how he plans to arrive. He could always get caught up. True enough. We shall assume business, then. Dinner should be soon, should it not? I have eaten nothing I like today. Dinner was indeed soon. They feasted on roast beef, cabbage, onions, corn, potatoes, and carrots. The king especially favored the buttery cabbage. The beef was a tad overcooked for his liking, but it was edible. His children kept exchanging glances and smiling at each other. It nearly drove him mad. It was like they were keeping something from him. What are you two so happy about? We're just happy to have you home, father, said Georgine, curtly. That's not it. His children hadn't been happy to see him since they were small, but he decided to accept the compliment. Yet the way they kept peeking at each other was bizarre. Are these the same people? They wouldn't even speak to one another before. Perhaps I should leave more often. King George poured himself a glass of wine. Would you like some, Georgine? She waved it away. Geoffrey? No, thank you. It's for the best if I don't. The king wasn't sure what his son had meant by that. So, father, said Geoffrey, who ended up winning the tournament? I heard of the riot, but nothing of the winner. I suppose the riot was the true event anyway. Don't say that. The riot was horrible. But a young warrior named Z ended up with the woven crown. He fought better than anyone I had ever seen, except perhaps Sir Jacob or Grant Grey. 
I promised him aid, which I should have never done, and met with his associate, Ben Blacksheep. Georgine and Geoffrey exchanged a befuddled look. Ben Blacksheep, you say? said Georgine. He was here just the other day. We spoke with him. Apparently he's the son of an eastern lord. We didn't believe anything he said, but we had nothing better to do, so we listened to him. Is that so? What did he say? Geoffrey dabbed his mouth with a napkin. Nothing really. He kept his speech ambiguous. It was confusing and upsetting. But he did say he was from the east, though he didn't say which hold. I need to keep up with the rest of the world more. I can't remember which Purinton or Robbins or Gallagher or Khan is on which throne. Is there any way to verify his claims? Do we know of any lords with a missing son? Not that I can say. William may know, but this Ben Blacksheep may assist in our plans regardless if it ever comes up. As long as enough people believe him. What was that, Geoffrey? Are you aware of our plans? Georgine? Georgine rested her chin on her palm. Yes, father. I told him our plans. He's the future king. He needs to know. And I understand, father, said Geoffrey. His voice was stern, something unusual. I know the legacy you want to leave, and I want to be a part of it. The king was shocked. Is that so? That makes my heart glad. Things really are turning upwards for this kingdom. I'm glad that my children are a part of it. Speaking of which, have we received any word from Gerald? Yes, we have. He is in Gardenfell now. Safe, apparently. We used our code to send him a message of our own, and it also has to do with this war in the East. The king had no idea of any code. What did you say to him? We gave him some information that would help him with his mission. Oh, the dungeons are empty as well. Georgine and Geoffrey smiled at each other. Welcome to the Storytime Saturday podcast. I'm your host, TGD. Uh, this week we see the first point of view chapter from the king, King George of the Middle Kingdom. So let's start, as we usually do, with the writing aspect. A very dumb mistake. You know, the usual stuff, bad punctuation, like semicolons where there should be a colon... But the worst mistake that I pointed out, and maybe you noticed it too, when Georgine said that Linwood and Larksvale are at war. Linwood and Larksvale are not at war. Mifflin and Larksvale are at war. So that is the worst mistake in, in the chapter, that Georgine says that Linwood and Larksvale are at war. That's not true. Mifflin and Larksvale are at war. So that was, a, that was a stupid mistake. But that's really the worst offense in this chapter. Now let's go over the characters. This is the first point of view chapter we have from King George. And we see early on that he knows the burden of power. He knows that it was an evil thing when he ordered to end the riot at all costs. But... He muses that it would have been more evil to not stop it. It was an evil thing to have all the rioters killed, but it would have been more evil to not do it. And, you know, that goes into his philosophy on crime. In a previous chapter, um, I think it was one of Jeffrey's chapters, Georgine pointed out that a judge could be appointed to deal with crime, but for some reason, the king wanted to do it himself. Now, we sort of see why here. Uh, he inherited a terrible situation in the Middle Kingdom, a skyrocketing crime rate. And that was probably the biggest issue they were facing, was a spiking crime rate in the Middle Kingdom. So he took it on himself to set the standard. He's like, okay, I'm going to set the precedent here. This is how things are going to be done. And we see that his method worked. People didn't want to commit crime anymore because they were fearful of the king's wrath. 
And we see that he's skeptical of both of his children, all three really, but he's especially skeptical of Georgine and Jeffrey. Uh, Lady Alice is mentioned too. She's mentioned that we actually see that she's actually bonkers. We're, we've been given hints here and there. We know that she's kind of crazy, but it's finally shown in its fullness, shaking and giddy that, uh, that the riot's going on and all these people are dying and she's, she's crazy. Uh, let's talk about Z. Finally, we get, I'll go in a little bit more in depth on this Z character. Z's appearance is described in more detail by the king since, you know, before in Sir Jacob's chapters, we were seeing him from far away. He's described as having almond eyes that were nearly yellow. Of course, Z is based on a friend of mine named Zack. Big up, Zack. Uh, Zack is part Filipino, so he has these yellow eyes. If the sun catches them right, his eyes are yellow. Uh, Zack, last I knew, was traveling around the world learning various martial arts. Like, he's gone to China, and he's, he's traveling all, over, the, over the U.S., going to different dojos and stuff. So that's a pretty sick concept for a character, honestly, for for uh, a side character that, that's out there. This character is traveling around the world, learning all different kinds of martial arts. We've seen that in the tournament, too, that he uses all different kinds of styles. He, we've seen him use judo, wrestling, Muay Thai, drunken fist. He's used all different kinds of martial arts. So that's a pretty sick concept for a character. Uh, big up Zach for giving uh, giving me a cool character, who who's really just him. Really, honestly, this character is just Zach. I mean, I usually say the characters' personalities are completely different. This is basically copy and paste of real Zach. This is actually how Zach is. <laughs> uh, he says he would have fought in the tournament even if there was no prize, which that's kind of cool. Z also requests to eat, uh, he gets this dinner with the king, and he, the king will give him whatever he wants, and the entire, uh, the, the, the resources of the kingdom are there at his fingertips. He can have whatever he wants as a celebratory meal. And what does he pick? Hard cheese and cured meat. Which IRL Zach loves? <laughs> Zach loves, uh, cured meat. I know he likes cheese, especially cured meat. I know he loves salami, but he hates sandwiches. He hates sandwiches because bread is a waste of calories, he says. <laughs> Which is true, honestly. I've never seen his abs, but he probably has them. Uh, we see that Z is allied with Ben Black Sheep, and even sort of leverages his favor with the king to, like, sort of broker some help for Ben. He's like, I'm just here for fighting, but maybe we'll need your help later. Now, i got to mention this S character. Uh, S is completely made up, as far as I know. I just needed an extra character. So I'm like, oh, well, there's this S character. And I feel kind of bad, because I remember when Zack... I was putting this out weekly... And Zack said, after after he read this chapter, he's like, I'm interested to see what this S character is. It's all honestly quite intriguing. And I'm like, well, I don't have anything planned for him. <laughs> he's just sort of an extra character. So yeah, S is completely made up. Ben Black Sheep makes an appearance in this chapter. This is the same Ben that saved Gerald from the bandits. The same Ben that was exiled from Larksvale. Uh, not much to say about him here, but he recognizes Sir Jacob. So take note of that, that he recognizes Sir Jacob. I didn't take any notes about Jeffrey and Georgine, but their relationship is completely turned upside down. They're, like, best buds now. They're really getting along. <laughs> so you might see a parallel here. Larksvale and Linwood. So it, the, the birth order sort of does fit uh so josh and brandon they're growing farther apart as you know the 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 as one gains like lordly kingly duties and georgine and jeffrey are coming closer so there's a bit of a, a literary parallel there happening uh brandon and jeffrey are parallel each other because they both sort of have doubts about themselves. Uh, 
and Josh and Georgine have parallels because they are a lot smarter and they uh, they were born wrong so they don't end up in line for the throne. And Ben and Gerald are parallels. Gerald hasn't killed any of his siblings, but they're both uh, traveling far from their home to take on some crazy convoluted quest. So that you might be, you might be putting that together yourself by now, because I know you're smart. You are smart. When uh, I shared this with some friends, one of them thought that some uh, Cersei and Jamie stuff was happening between Jeffrey and Georgine. No, that's not happening. <laughs> that's, that's not the case here. What what the heck is wrong with people? Like, you can't just have people getting along. They always have to make them do stuff together. It's sick. <laughs> now, a few notes. Um, there's a lot of stuff in this chapter I have no clue about, especially at the end. I up the intrigue and stuff. At the end, they're talking about, ooh, Gerald's plans, and Ben has secret plans that he might come back with later, and all kinds of stuff. It's... As I've said before, I was banking on future me to come up with something. <laughs> now, this is the last chapter in my, like, NaNoWriMo pursuit. So, I crossed the 50,000 word threshold with this chapter. So, there's 68,000 words in this whole document. So we have 18,000 words more to go, and some of that might be notes that I made farther down. So there are some chapters below this one, but this is where I hit the 50,000 word threshold, this King George chapter. So I set this to the side, celebrated Christmas, and I think I picked it back up in January. So I, I started, during that time I was mulling it over in my head, these secret plans... And I think these uh, these plans are very stupid. <laughs> so I think King George, his secret plan is to just take over the world. And he's doing that one step at a time. So I think he sent Jeffrey up to Gardenfell to really sort of sow discord and subvert uh, their democracy. Cause a civil war. And then the Middle Kingdom would come in and create stability. I think that might have been the plan. We'll see in the upcoming weeks. But this is also the last thing I released to friends. So some people that might be listening to this might have read all of this previously. The stuff that comes after is never before seen. This is the first time, this is the first time this will be shown to anyone these next chapters coming up. And next week, we will see what's going on with Jordan. We get another Jordan chapter. I think this is... Was this Jordan's second chapter? It's already halfway through the book, and it's Jordan's... More, more than halfway, like three quarters through, and this is Jordan's second chapter. <laughs> and honestly... Uh, I've mentioned this before at the start that I never finished this. This is all sort of like a, a an essay, I guess, on on my my previous writing pursuits. This whole thing should probably be like two hundred thousand words if I were to bring this story to a a conclusion, and I'm not gonna because it's it's bad, and you'll see that this really jumps the shark. It jumps the shark and it starts getting dumber <laughs> after this. If you thought it was dumb now, it gets worse. It gets a lot worse. So come back for that. Come back next week. I don't think this Jordan chapter is bad, though. I think it's good. I don't remember, though. But come back next week for the Storytime Saturday podcast. It's been fun. Make sure you like on YouTube, like wherever you may be watching or listening. Subscribe on YouTube at the underscore Chalice channel. Go check out some other videos. Make sure you're subscribed. And I'll see you next week on the Storytime Saturday podcast.